My mom's family, they were dairy farmers going back to the potato diaspora. They were up in northern, uh, northwestern Vermont, actually all across the northern tier of Vermont. Um, and during the Depression, actually there was Dust Bowl conditions here, which is severe drought. It wasn't as bad as in the Midwest. Um, her dad, my grandpa, had to actually do the unthinkable. He had to go to the bank and borrow money. What the bank said is, you will grow this kind of bean, white navy beans, um, and then we'll loan you the money. He's like, nobody around is buying white navy beans. It's like, well, too bad. You want to get the money? Is get a grow white navy beans. So of course he planted the white navy beans. They had a crop, and guess what? There's no place to sell them to. The bank said, hey, thank you very much. We like the farm. Buy, go away, oh. and confiscate the farm. So you can understand some of the stories that were in my childhood of, of how the financial system and the politics are rigged against the producer. It's no different today, ladies and gentlemen. We, you know, we were, we're in Las Vegas. We're playing cards, and the, and the deck is stacked against us. Um, we need to just understand that. Um, also, both of them uh, just had a passion for being outdoors. My dad got me into the, you know, the wild outdoors, and my mom was like an avid gardener. A canner and a freezer and all that kind of stuff. It was their interest in growing food and gardening that uh, allowed them to bump into this couple right here, Helen and John Philbrick. John Philbrick, uh, at the time, was the president of the Biodynamic Farming Association, which is an organic farming and gardening association that predates the organic wor word by about, oh, 80 years or so. Um, and uh, they were in Duxbury, Massachusetts, and once a month would have like these gang meetings down in Duxbury, Massachusetts. In like the late 60s, all of a sudden these long-haired people started to show up and it was like really groovy and stuff. I couldn't believe it, like a 10-year-old kid, I'm seeing like people with no clothes on. It's like, whoa, this is gonna be a cool world I'm growing up into. But, um, these really cool people that breezed through when they were in their 20s. Um, one, for example, his name was Rob Johnson. He wanted, he was into seeds, totally into seeds. He started a small seed company up in Maine called Johnny's Seeds. Another guy was this um, uh, Benny, uh, Benny Cohen. Him and his uh, buddy Jerry started a little ice cream company. Uh, some other folks that came through, uh, one was, um, <laughs> I didn't necessarily like him as a kid because he didn't like kids. His name was Elliot Coleman. Um, but I've known Elliot Coleman since I was like 10 years old. He's a really cool guy. Uh, and then one of my favorite people, my dad was really buddies with this guy, Samuel Kamen, who you know, had like seven of these gorgeous daughters. My dad's trying to you know, convince Samuel to match up three of those daughters with his three sons. And so would go up on weekends and help this poor hippie guy with his farm and all that kind of stuff. Man, the side of this hill where he had his field was just full of stones. And we moved so many tons of stones from this field. And I can remember in the rain once up to my ankles pushing a wheelbarrow full of cucumbers that Samuel was selling as, as pickles. Um, and Samuel made one quart jars of yogurt behind his wood stove in a cooler. And they were really heavy to transport. And he did a little racket, you know, doing this raw milk yogurt thing. And because he, he cultured the yogurt in one quart containers, the, the cream floated to the top and it made a cream on the top of it. And my dad said, well, gee, I work in plastics factories and we throw out loads of these, these one quart plastic containers. Why don't you get a whole bunch of these things? I'll get them out of the dumpster in you know, the afternoon and we'll bring them up to you. So he started packaging his Samuel's yogurt in one quart plastic containers with the cream on top. So this guy, Samuel, came in with the stony field. Where do you think his yogurt company went? So, that was kind of like the context of where I grew up was, was in this particular time period. Uh, Lancaster, Massachusetts, home of Luther Burbank. Luther Burbank, way before we ever knew anything about inheritance, uh, alleles, chromosomes, or DNA, this guy to this day has more plant varieties to his name than anybody else. Luther Burbank. The style of, of breeding that he came up with has become known as Burbanking. It's mass selection. You take seeds from whatever it is and you plant a, sh a bunch. And then out of that bunch, you select the ones that have your traits. And what you're able to do that way is you can select from multiple traits in a single generation. And any geneticist will tell you that you can't select from multiple traits in every generation because the numbers go through the roof. That's the point. You put the numbers through the roof and you select from 10 zillion seeds, the one or two or three or five that have the traits that you want, that recombine them and recombine them and recombine them forever. The actual, the Burbank potato, McDonald's French fry potato was bred, it was a wild find, he planted seeds. He planted seeds and this one didn't get bothered by potato bugs and it didn't get late blight and they made these big ugly potatoes that nobody liked. 
It's McDonald's French fry potato today is the, is the Burbank potato. It was developed in Lancaster down in the floodplains of the Nashua River. I grew up uh, one side of the hill from uh, this guy over here. So Luther, Luther Burbank's place was on the south side of the hill. And John Chapman, this guy's place was on the north side of the hill. Johnny Appleseed, born in Lancaster, Massachusetts. The idea that you go take seeds from apples and you spread them every which way and you get this wild variety of apples. Um, I think it's in Michael Pollan's book where he describes about the renaissance of apple genetics. That this guy right here was responsible for more recombination of apple genetics in North America than any other event in apple history. This guy just spread seedlings everywhere. And what you would do as a grower in order to get your homestead plan, you plant like 20 of these apple trees. The ones that suck, you cut them off. And the ones that are good, you graft the good one onto the, onto the bad root. Now you've got an orchard. Might take five, 10 years or so, but you're gonna live there. This is your homestead. Now you have an orchard of disease, pest and disease resistant fruit. How did you find that? By planting a zillion seedlings, selecting the best, and then grafting them together. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, um, I seek to confront life, and if it's mean, I want to know the full meanness of it, and if it's sublime, I want to know the sublime. I took to the woods. And uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, big influences on my, on my uh, younger reading life. <clears throat> a lot of the defiance and the strength and the revolutionary spirit that I inherited was from like the, the bridge at Concord, 1776. Um, the first person shot at the Concord Bridge was Abner Hosmer. Um, who was from Lancaster. The Lancaster militia marched from Lancaster, Massachusetts all the way to Concord. And as a Boy Scout, I would march from Lancaster to Concord, which is a long way, it's like 19 miles, and wears you the heck out, and go to the bridge. But what we did is like with 25 people, we stood up to the largest empire on the planet and said, this will pass. You will not, you will not take us down. And another act of defiance for this gal, Mary Rowlandson, strong woman, the first book ever written uh, in North America authored by a female. She was the wife of a garrison um, chief. He went off, it was the King Philip's War in 1642 or 43. He's off chasing the Indians around the woods. The Indians come around to the homestead. They burn the homestead to the ground. She got her spinning wheel and sat it out in the middle of the yard and started spinning yarn with the kids around her and singing. And I guess they went up to her and they're like, that's badass. And so then they said, well, let's, let's not kill her like we did everybody else. They killed like four of the six children. They took two of the kids and they took her uh, and held her captive and sent ransom notes. And she eventually, she, she survived the winter and was ransomed in the spring in Princeton, Massachusetts. Uh, both of her kids, you know, including a nursing uh, infant, died during that particular winter. So this is some of my history right here in, in Massachusetts. I grew up when all of a sudden the oil producing and exporting countries decided to cut off our oil. And when I was uh, in a, we're in a gas line, you can only get gas on even or odd days based on your license plate number. You can only get like 10 gallons at a time. We had a Volkswagen Squareback to cut, you know, get more efficient car and all that. Um, my baby brother's in the front seat in a kitty seat. And me and my uh, young, next younger, who's the oldest sibling in this room? All of you oldest siblings will back me on this and you know as a fact that the next one down never pulls their weight, right? Never did. And then the little kid got away with murder. So my little brother's in the front throwing Cheerios and screaming and getting smacked around by my mom who's freaking out and stressing, uh, the car runs out of gas. So me and my brother have to get out and push. I'm the oldest and we get on the bumper, you'd think my little brother helped me push. I pushed that car for about a half a mile in a gas line, probably took us half the day to finally get gas. I had plenty of time to think about our dependency on fossil fuel and how insane this whole network was and we've gotta get away from our absolute critical dependency on fossil fuel. It was also the time when um, the politics changed in Washington, D.C., and they passed these really new laws intended to stimulate business, which ended up in the largest industrial business collapse in the United States history. Millions of people were out of work. You know, almost as many people, maybe more people, were out of work because of the industrial movement from all the, our manufacturing capacity here to overseas, from Nicaragua to China, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was a time of year when finally people with dark brown skin were considered to be fully human. What? Yeah, right, civil rights. Um, I remember when Martin Luther King was shot. Uh, I remember when the US military was brought out against college students at universities and shot them dead. I can remember when the river, the big game would be what color is the river? Is it gonna be red, is it gonna be green, is it gonna be blue? Because 
the, the paper factories and the leather factories that were dumping their waste in the river. Oh, we can't afford wastewater treatment plants. It's just, it's unproven technology. Um, and also I can just remember, you know, tugging on my mom's aprons. That's when moms wore aprons too. So what's a body bag? You know, what, what's, what's all this mean? What's it all about? The whole Vietnam thing, it's just crazy. And to be a little kid and watch somebody, when somebody kneels down on the ground in television, somebody takes a gun to the side of the head and shoots them. That was like this big, huge television thing. It kind of got me thinking, I gotta, I gotta do something about this. About that time, I ran into this <coughs> book called Tree Crops. I mentioned my parents were both avid gardeners. We had big gardens. We grow like, uh, you know, probably like an acre worth of produce because we didn't have a lot of money. And I'm the smallest of three brothers. Uh, they also subscribed to some magazines, early years of Mother Earth News, um, Organic Gardening, Prevention Magazine, all the different Rodale publications. And then uh, this book was written by John and Helen Philbrick. They also wrote the Bug Book, the first book talking about IPM, you know, knowing, understanding insect life cycles, et cetera. Um, also wrote a book with Richard Gregg, who was one of Gandhi's. I met Richard Gregg, I don't remember him at all. Uh, one of Gandhi's like sidekick followers, and they wrote the book, um, the Power of Nonviolence, which was one of Martin Luther King's um, big uh, motivators. And so it was at that time that I learned about agriculture not being all this like really friendly to the planet. That what you do is in order to grow our crops, you got to destroy the ecosystem, then you disturb the soil. You either use a plow, back then it was all plow and, and disc arrows, uh, and then you plant your seeds in the ground. When, it, when the wind blows, it blows the soil away uh, in the wind. When it rains, it washes away in the water. We can do conservation practices with like, you know, horizontal um, contour strips and we can have hick and bottom drains and, and riparian buffer strips and wind breaks. We do all the USDA practices and it's just less bad. And this guy got all his, his conservation practices funded by the federal government. He still has massive erosion and then he goes ahead and he gets, uh, he gets compensated for crop loss. He didn't have to do a thing other than plant his crops and he collected money all season long. A couple years ago in a drought, um, all the folks in our area uh, they realized that after the first cutting of hay, there weren't going to be any other cuttings of hay. And they also realized there wasn't going to be any corn this year because it was just so dry. So they plowed up every hillside they possibly could and planted their corn. You declare your acres for how many acres of corn you planted. You get your, your corn base payment, which is a check per acre of corn, of land that you can plant corn on. Another check to say, okay, you did plant corn. And then when it didn't make a crop, you get a check for crop failure. What a racket. Well, then you have all these barren hillsides, it rains, the rain comes back, and it's a mess. So, learn a lot that government policy has a lot to do with, uh, with <laughs> the health of our ecosystem. So, annual agriculture, it was this real bugaboo, you know, just for a few hard seeds, for some wheat, for some soybeans. This picture right here is taken at a, at a state wayside. This is a historic spot where these guys during the, um, the Northwest Reserve survey team that the Jefferson administration, you know, the, you remember the Jefferson administration, right? Um, they sent these guys west, everybody, you walk and every six miles you stop and you describe what you see. The previous stop six miles before this was somewhere near Athens, Ohio, and they described being in a forest of American chestnut about eight foot diameter, 100 million feet tall, with an understory of sugar maple um, that has like three foot diameter trunks 60 foot tall before you get to the first branch. They wrote, they weren't impressed with the, with the abundance of amazing, sheer quantity, hundreds of tons of chestnuts that would be falling off of that in the fall. They were uh, discouraged because if they didn't find grass within a day, they were gonna have to turn around and go back um, because they had to feed their horses. So here they came to the spot and they found uh, approximately six uh, oak trees per acre, big, huge, widespreading oak, grass taller than the heads of their horses. And it was a who's who of American wildlife black bear and grizzly bear, uh, the um, eastern mountain lions hanging out in a tree with deer dripping off the, lead, off the branches because they caught them and just hanging and wait to eat them later. Herds of white-tailed deer, herds of elk, yes, elk are native to the east coast of the United States as well. Uh, ground nesting birds, the, like the um, prairie chickens, thank you, stuff like that, all over the place. Um, so of course, Europeans show up. This is part of what drew the, the westward movement into the, um, into the Ohio River Basin. So when people, white people got here, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so much organic matter in the soil, it holds water forever. We gotta make a ditch and drain the water away. We got all these trees in the way, we gotta cut them down. When people, people needed hard plows to get through this prairie sod, it wasn't 
grassroots that were preventing them from uh, plowing the sod. It was tree roots. You got an oak tree that's fire resistant. It grows for three or four years. A fire goes through, the root stays there, and it sprouts back next year, and it sprouts back the next year, and the root becomes old growth roots in a grassland, and you don't even see the little trees because they never make it past the, the fire year that comes through. So once you drain it all away, you plow it all up, blows away, washes away. Um, the fertility cycle is short-circuited. Now you have to start adding bags of this and that and the other thing, and you wonder why there's only like one family per 10 square miles in some of the, some of the grain belt of the USA. Any time and every time humanity has depended on annual crops as its staple food crops, um, every time this ever in the history of the world that humans have depended on annual crops as their staple foods, their carbohydrates, proteins, and oils, it's ended up in collapse. Who knows where this picture is? I started showing this picture before troubles began um, and just wanted to show that why would people have built such a grand city in the middle of a wasteland? This was the eastern capital of the Roman Empire in Palmyra, which is now in Syria. It wasn't a wasteland. It had rivers for transportation, communication, and irrigation, and watering people and livestock. It had rich, deep alluvial soils. <clears throat> um, it had timber, because you need timber for warships and chariots and fuel and charcoal and all that kind of stuff. So you cut everything down, you plow it all up, you blow it away in the wind, wash it out to sea, you lose your fertility. Now you start going hungry, you get together and you march and you go take over the next people. That's the history of annual agriculture. Not only does annual agriculture wipe out the ecosystem, the very first thing it has to do before that is it has to wipe out the people who are already living there. That's just how it works. Every place where you know, this annual agriculture goes, it wipes out the indigenous first, then destroys the ecosystem, and then has to go to the next place to take over the next thing. This bothered me. But I couldn't stop, I had to get a good job. I went to Worcester Polytech, WPI, up in Wista there. And I got out, of, got out of Wista and got a job at Natick Labs, which is uh, the military equipment manufacturing and testing grounds for, for, the, uh, for the military. And it was just by a fluke that I was on the crew that developed the Kevlar infantry helmet. It had nothing to do with me other than I was the, the low kid on the totem pole that got hired for the job. One Monday morning I go down, I turn on the TV, this is back when they invented the remote, really cool, and I push the button on the Mr. Coffee, it wasn't a smart coffee machine. And as the coffee was percolating down, coming dripping down through the machine, I watched the TV and I watched my helmet land uh, on the heads of the 82nd Airborne as they landed in Grenada. And we went to war and had that massive conflagration down in Grenada, it's like, wait a minute. Everything that we do, everything that you do and everything that I do ripples outward from us. No matter what we do, it has positive or negative effects on our world and cosmos around us. And I actually was fortunate enough to be able to see what my life choices and what my food choices did to the world around me. I saw that where I got my food from resulted in this kind of crap. Where I actually sought my employment resulted in, in war and conflict all over the place. How I transport myself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, I gotta change. So I quit. I went to Unity College in Maine to study ecology. Now I'm gonna be like Steve Irwin, totally dangerous, gonna be studying NYCHA. Uh, studied forest ecology, graduated 1985 during the Reagan administration when politics once again was not really all in favor of studying nature because those are weirdo hippie freaks that want to preserve nature and they're communists. And so I ran off to Alaska, homestead in Alaska for 10 years and had a lot of time to read and think. When I was up there, I discovered this book, Permaculture by Bill Mollison. Um, ate it up because this was ecology, this was engineering, this was design, and this was applied on the real planet to solve real problems, to create real solutions for real human needs. It's like, I'm all in. Took a permaculture design course, uh, began a correspondence with Bill Mollison, and eventually got uh, a diploma from Bill. When I got my diploma, permaculture meant permanent agriculture. Now, to me, agriculture means growing food, enough food that will feed me, and then I will have a surplus to exchange with somebody else. And how we exchange that, that's, that's a different story. But the, the aim is to create systems that are ecologically sound and economically profitable. And much of the designs take it from NYCHA. They could be as simple or as sophisticated as you like. Right there, right out of the guy's mouth. He wrote the book, he probably talked about this, thought about this more than anybody else. What he did not say 
is this is a technique to figure out how many different ways you can learn how to shit in a plastic bucket. Okay? That's not permaculture. It's a tool, it's a technique, it's not permaculture. How many different ways can you stack 16 bricks to make a rocket stove and burn a handful of grass? And no, a rocket mass heater will not heat your house on a handful of grass if there's not enough BTUs in that grass to heat the enclosed box with the R value of the walls with the temperature on the outside. That's real design. So I got a little bit upset with the transition as the permaculture movement moved on, but what I really like about it, based on three ethics, earth care, people care, and the third ethic, a lot of people can't even agree on it, but I've actually embraced this one that, um, oh heck, I forgot their name, out of uh, Wisconsin, they're gonna kill me for forgetting it. It's, I mean, they're out of um, Oregon, Washington. Um, the, the Permaculture Women's Guild or whatever it is, instead of having all these convoluted things, is look, it's all about care for the future. Whatever we do with these two enterprises here, any profits or surplus that we have gets plowed back into the productivity of the system and it goes back to support earth care and people care. Well, what's that other than care of the future? And I said a word that a lot of people get uncomfortable with, profit. If I take a seed that weighs less than an 18th of an ounce and I put it in the ground and I walk away from it and I let the wind and the sun and the rain do all that kind of stuff, it's going to interact with its environment and it will actually gain, it'll gain mass and it will gain useful carbohydrate in it over time and in the course of a year it has actually had a real ecological gain. If you take a tree in the northeast it's approximately a 7% gain every single year. You plant a field of trees, you stand back and I'm just going to cut them down for toilet paper in 30 years, you'll have about a 7% return on investment. That's real ecologically based profit is so it's okay for us to have a profit and if we don't we go out of business and that's the ultimate in unsustainability. So I took these crackpot ideas and uh, while I was up in Alaska, and I said, well, let's, let's translate this to the real world. Let's go right into the belly of the beast, and let's show how we can convert an annual cornfield, um, GMO, you know, soy and corn, to a perennial food producing system, and let's have the system pay its own way. We're not gonna beg for grants, become a professional begging organization. We're actually gonna do something. We're gonna produce real food for real people, for real, no joke. And we're gonna produce enough of it that we can sell it for enough revenue to pay for the further reinvestment in it to continue the process. So if you want to hear a little bit more about the business side of things, come tomorrow afternoon at 1.30 and be prepared. Don't have a weak stomach. Um, the world is not the way you are told it is. It's the way on the other side of the wizard's curtain is where the real action is. That's where we're going to go. All of what you see here, the patterning on this farm, it's not done out of woo-woo. This is done out of water management. I don't have time to go into it, but all the patterns that you see here serve to distribute water from high in the valleys to slightly lower out on the ridges. Because <clears throat> the idea here is, is if the rain falls on the ground, that's a useful resource. That's, that's better than fertilizer. My plants won't grow without it. So by simple little earth scratching techniques and how I walk, how my fences go, etc., we'll spread that water out, soak it in, so in drought years, we'll have a reserve stored in the soil, in the biological, in the biological life in the soil, in the stems of plants, et cetera. And the, the goal was to have the farm shift from <coughs> annual production to perennial production. And, and as of now, it's approximately 98% uh, perennial, 110 acre. Is that Pardon? Is that elevation it is not elevation contoured. The, there's actually a book that was supposed to be released this coming Tuesday at the Acres USA conference. It's not finished because we're missing that topographical map because we're trying to find one that actually does comply with key lines. It's, it's, a, it's just an adaptation of the USDA um, water management codes because we live in the USA. We have to follow their best management practices or you get busted. Um, so it's not contour um, and it's not key line. Wrote a book about my experiences. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I don't have a laboratory. I don't have a you know, a, a PhD, I don't have a, an employment, I haven't been employed since 1982 for crying out loud. Uh, and so what I did is I wrote about my experiences. And this, what, what I wrote about in that book is not something that I'm trying to convince you about, it's what I've done, it's real. This is a real place, you can get in it, you can walk around it and you can see the food absolutely everywhere. And it's not, it doesn't look like what you're told that it's supposed to look like. I've made apple orchardists have come over to my apple place and thrown up because it just did not comply. It, it broke every single rule that they said that you're supposed to comply with. 
I learned a little step-by-step -step procedure that I'm just gonna bullet point through here quickly. First thing is we gotta do is, uh, is identify our biome. Where do we live on planet Earth? What are the dominant plant community types? <clears throat> Permaculturists like to say, oh yeah, we're gonna plant guilds. We have to discover guilds. This plant works with this plant lives with that plant lives. We have to discover this in our backyards. It's like, look, nature's figured this out. Nature's figured out what plants go with what other plants either for the past, what, two billion years or 6,000 years, depending on your reference book. It doesn't matter. Nature knows how to do this. Imitate nature, then interact with it. <clears throat> then we construct the earthworks to manage our water. Then we're gonna establish perennial polycultures that are identified in step one. How many of you guys have seen vegetation growing in the ditch on the side of the road? Do you know what that vegetation is, for one? Do you know how to identify all those plants? And then two, is it a monocrop? If it's mowed grass, it might be a kind of a limited polyculture, but there's usually this brushy tangle. That is an ecological Rosetta Stone that tells you how to grow a sustainable food production system. Because on the ditch on the side of the road, who prepared the soil for three years with cover crops, compost teas, manure, mulches, a deep ripping in the soil, proper mineral balance? Who did that for three years prior to the ditch on the side of the road growing stuff? Okay, well then, who, who pruned it properly and laid the right kind of mulch and did the proper foliar spray and horns in a bucket and spinning this and that and cosmic pipes, who did that? Nobody. If anybody did anything to the plants in the ditch on the side of the road, they hit it with a mower or herbicide. And what did it do? It came back. That's sustainable agriculture. That is sustainable agriculture. If you have to plant your crops again next year, that's not sustainable, not sustainable. So we're gonna imitate what nature's doing because it's got something going, oh, oh, by the way, if that person didn't do any of the site preparation and, and mulches and compost teas and all these doodads and the other things, what were the input costs? Zero. So if you have zero input costs and you go pick raspberries on the side of the road, what is your, your rate of return, your economic rate of return? It's infinitely incalculable. As a matter of fact, you do the math and divide by zero, it's called imaginary numbers. You wanna accuse me of anything? Accuse me of working in the world of imaginary numbers because everything out here at a certain point in time is being, not just being harvested at almost zero input costs, oftentimes it's being harvested at a profit. <laughs> How can you do that? Imitate nature. Locate your fence, all the patterns follow uh, the water management pattern. Then we just manage for eternity. Let's say that the planet's been around 6,000 years. That's, that's an eternity for you and me, right? How long has it been doing that without human beings industrially interacting with it? Most of the time. We've only been doing this kind of agriculture uh, historically for about 6,000 years. It's been alive for as long as we know as a planet. It's been alive, living and seething with stuff, um, taking care of itself all by itself. So we, we know that this planet can take care of itself. We know these life forms can take care of themselves. And all we gotta do is, is manage using uh, the disturbance regimes that nature usually would, and they'll most commonly, they're fire, they're wind, flood deposition, and animal impact. But first, let's talk a little bit about ecological succession. You can start with rock anywhere on the planet, bare stone, solid, there's no life on it whatsoever. Maybe there's some kind of weird things in the cracks in there, uh, but let's just say right now it's sterile. First, what's gonna happen, out of the atmosphere, these little things kind of float in and they land, uh, oftentimes the first things are lichen. And lichens are an algae fungus combination. The, the algae photosynthesizes, takes sunlight right out of the atmosphere, holy crap. Whether it's packets or waves or photons, we don't care, I don't care. It takes sunlight right out of the air and it, and it takes carbon dioxide right out of the air and it makes sugar, simple sugar that it feeds the fungus. The fungus takes the sugars in and it excretes these acids that dissolve the rock. Well then the, then the Algae can now take up the salt, the, this liquid rock into itself. So with sun, wind, rain, um, and the minerals, and life, life actually begins the process of creating soil, turning the solid planet and the liquids to here, the, the gases that are in the atmosphere, and turns it into soil. The first lichens start to die, they decompose. Other decomposer organisms are floating around in the atmosphere, and pretty soon all the dead bodies of, of the lichens can support moss. And after a while, the mosses can support, you know, a little bit of grass seed starts to grow. Then the grass starts to make enough soil. Now trees can start to grow. This whole entire process 
uh, is limited by hot, cold, dry, wet, and the chemical composition of the bedrock. But this happens everywhere on the planet regardless period, this process of plant succession. If you were to go grab a tuft of that grass and pull it up, what would you find at the roots of those plants? Soil. Where did the soil come from? The soil was created out of thin air and solid rock by the biology itself. These are what the lessons that we need to learn of how to create soil on our farms. Succession follows pathways that are pretty well known around the world based on where you're from. You know, folks in the desert southwest are going to have a different successional pathway that goes from solid rock to mature system. The Midwest will have a different pathway that goes from <coughs> solid rock to mature system, northeast, etc. Different bedrock types will have a different plant community types that go along with it. And that's where we've got to do our homework and imitate the plant community types that are part of this process. Then we just go ahead and we start where our farm is now, where our property is now, which might be bare rock. I'm still looking for somebody who has a 10 acre lake in the middle of Spednik Lake up on the Maine and Quebec border, and I'll show you how to farm that. A rock, a solid rock in the middle of the lake, I'll show you how to farm it. This is how you farm it. You use nature's process of creating soil, building soil, building abundance. Then at some point in time, there's some kind of disturbance, <laughs> resets the whole system and it starts over again. So to understand that a prairie is not a thing, it's not a static thing, it's, it's a phase in ecosystem development. And what can happen is if you're at prairie phase, if this fire comes along and the trees are starting to get established, kaboom, burns them, it goes back to grassland. That grassland will get, stay as a grassland based on shortage of water and or frequency of fire. Um, and so on through the whole process. I want, um, hopefully I'll get to it later, but I want you guys to, before you go home, whatever, look up aerial photos from Paradise, California. I want you to look at the, there's not a single house there except for you know, one or two randoms that made it. And then look at the trees. What? Yeah, look at the vegetation. The vegetation's okay. California is a fire site, period. It is a fire site. Fire comes through periodically and you can carve a redwood and you look at the fire scars on the rings through there and you know, oh, every so many years these come through. Oh, Moderna's catastrophic. Oh yeah, that one was. You know, the 600 year drought that California went through, there was lots of fires, catastrophic fires like that. And the plant community types are adapted to that. They survive. One of the, one of the, the, the uh, species in the plant community with redwood happens to be sugar pine. Biggest pine cones on the face of the planet. Makes all kinds of pine nuts. So some of the uh, um, disturbances that we want to imitate for what they do. Are we, are we going to stay in a semi-open savanna phase? Are we going to stay in a grassland phase? Are we going to go to a more closed canopy forested phase with no grass on the bottom? We use disturbance, imitating the natural disturbance regimes of our area, and we'll keep it to maximum productivity. As we change through time, the animal communities change as well because there's different habitats available. Instead of going in, eradicating a habitat, plowing it all up so it all blows away, washes away, and then having to go apply for a grant to the USDA to put in a habitat island is insanity. Why not live on a habitat refuge and farm in such a way that we are, we are the refuge, we are the habitat island as we're going through successional time. Um, the bird life, oh my gosh, the change in bird life as you, as you live on a successional farm is pretty incredible. Insect life. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been driving long enough in a tractor mowing grass or doing whatever you're doing. I was chipping sticks behind me and all of a sudden I felt this thing in the back of my neck. It's like, ah! It was a walking stick like eight inches long. It's like, wow, I dare you to find one of those in a cornfield. Now, how, we, how nature creates soil, we already talked about that basic process, success, succession, I'm trying to talk too slow. We have to think about the whole picture. Nature doesn't work in bits and pieces. Yes, there are bits and pieces there, but to think about soil from one perspective and one perspective only is missing the rest of the, rest of the boat. How nature creates soil, there's plant and animal litter, it's deposition. It can blow in in the wind, it can be grown on site, it's the grass that mats down on top, it's leaves that drop down, then that decomposes. Well, there are organisms that decompose that. The litter is made up primarily of carbon. So the carbon is, what is carbon in the economy of nature? Energy. It's energy, it's what we put in our cars, it's what we put in our wood stoves, or you know, furnaces, or whatever, the coal in the power plants. 
Uh, so the, the energy for this whole soil cycle is the carbon. Um, now we've got minerals. The, the rocky uh, subsoil, the, the, the bedrock that we have, there's only certain minerals in the subsoil here, period. You will have shortages and plants will grow here that are adapted to this particular soil type. Or if you're trying to grow a different plant, you may need to add extra minerals to it um, so that you'll get plants to grow faster or different types of plants. One of the biggest sources of fertility um, in the soil creation process is stuff that blows in in the wind, dry deposition, or wet deposition with when rain <coughs> comes in. Uh, rain comes in, one of the things about the Northeast, I don't know if you knew this, there are soil test records that go way back to back when there were no scrubbers on coal-fired power plants in the Midwest and in the, in the East Central. And then once scrubbers started to be put on, the sulfur levels in agricultural soils in the Northeast dropped precipitously, which is great if you don't want to like acidify red pines up at the top of Camel's Hump in Vermont, but it's not so great if you're actually trying to construct a protein and you need some sulfur to get nutri nutrients into the roots of your plants. So the sulfur is an essential nutrient. You can't have too much of anything, of course. Um, when the water strikes the tree, that's like four to, four to ten percent of trees' nitrogen needs comes from the nitrogen that came from the raindrops dripping and soaking through lichens growing on the bark and branches of a tree. It's like, whoa, okay, cool. Well then, of course, this animal's doing that thing, pooping and peeing. It's not just the, uh, the nutrient that's in the poop and pee, it's also the, the bacteria. Uh, all of the decomposer organisms on that that help to break it all down, assimilate it, make it in a plant-ready form. And then, of course, it's the plant itself exuding sugars. It's really funny, you know, it used to be, oh yeah, plants, roots, they leak these sugars. It's like just oozing sugar. It's like, what, there's some kind of accident? Like we have junk DNA, there's DNA in our bodies, it doesn't do anything? Um, I don't think so. Um, so this plant's these liquid carbon pathway, they're pumping sugar into the soil. And then who goes and eats it are all the decomposers. The decomposers poop and they pee, and then the plant sends out a little root and goes and sucks it all up. So that's part of the soil building process. Now if you focus on any one of these items, you may indeed show increases in yields. If you focus on mulch, um, ramiole, wood chips, biochar, all this kind of stuff, you're focusing on the litter component of it. Well. It's not the litter that does it, it's all about the bugs, it's this bugs, that bugs. If you keep putting the bugs on the system and you don't have any fuel to feed the bugs, the bugs are gonna die, so you gotta go buy more bugs and do more bugs. Yes, you may get a bump, but that's not the whole picture. Or if you go do the whole minerals thing, you balance your minerals, you balance your minerals, you balance your minerals, but you're not putting enough carbon down there and you're not having enough proper mix of the decomposers, that's really not gonna work either and you're still gonna be in the treadmill of adding more minerals, adding more minerals. Uh, water is critical, without the water, you're not gonna get soil growth and without actual plants pumping these carbon compounds into the soil. All of it is what matters. Now how do we, one, imitate nature's uh, <coughs> successional pathway where we can take rock and turn it into 200 foot deep topsoil over a period of time, and then how do we include the whole entire soil building process on our farm instead of getting stuck in these little bit solution. Um, we need to look at big pictures. The details are up to, up to all of us. If you live on a vein of, of calcium, um, that way, I guess it is, uh, down in, uh, what is it, West Lime or Lime Rock, Lime Rock, Connecticut. There's this big vein of limestone that goes through it. That's a different, totally different soil building regime as it is out in Cape Cod, which is a big granitic sand pile. Um, the, this process still applies. Just different players are gonna be in there. are gonna have different plants, different animals, different mineral compositions. So your strategy is gonna be different. This is soil that's built Gabe Brown's style. This is done on New Forest Farm in Southwest Wisconsin. When we started, it was abandoned cornfield, red clay. You could make bricks, probably would have been the best um, product that we should have done is make bricks out of it. But by growing our annual crops, grain crops, uh, long-term cover crops, clovers, you know, mixes of uh, deep-rooted, shallow-rooted nitrogen fixers, non-nitrogen fixers, uh, and including grazing in the mix, we actually turned red clay soil into black soil by farming it. This works. However, when we, uh, on the places that have uh, more an integration with the woody components, we've got stuff like this. Now, both of these are topsoil. Would you rather farm in soil like this or like that? Um, 
What this is, is this was from the, the alleys in between these jungle, polyculture jungle rows of trees. So it is field soil, but this is virtually approaching forest soil conditions. It's almost pure compost. That's the kind of stuff that, that I like to build over time. We can do this all by itself using only natural products, natural players. And you don't have to buy bags from somewhere else to put it on. Don't tell any of these guys out here. Probably some of you are in the room. Uh, if we design our systems, imitating nature, imitate the natural plant community types, we'll do this. It'll, it does this on its own. And it'll look different no matter where you are. If you're in the tropics, it's going to look like that. If you're in the desert, it's going to look like that. Africa is like that. That's up in Alaska. By the way, just to let you know, in Anchorage, 7.9 was the biggest shock that they had. Lots of roads on the west side of Anchorage are destroyed. Uh, ground phone is out, electricity is out in half the town. My brother's tequila collection that was in wooden barrels has survived. And he will be, <laughs> he will be supplying Las Margaritas tonight with all of the tequila out of his special reserve barrels. All of their glass bottle tequila broke. So if you're going to Las Margaritas tonight in Anchorage, your plane won't land there because the runway is destroyed. But there will be tequila. Plant community mimicry. This is, these are the guilds, plant community types. And think about this. Plants that are adapted to a specific set of environmental conditions are the most likely to be the best competitors on that site. If you're trying to grow a plant where you live and you're having a hard time growing it, you can go and you can buy all these different things to try to get it to grow. Or you can switch plants. That's the wrong plant, maybe. I've taken the extreme approach of if it doesn't want to grow, let it die. And so I'm going to plant a lot of things. And if it dies, good riddance. I'm not interested in that one. This is one of the most beautiful places in the world, in Croatia, where uh, a high calcium water comes through one kind of limestone underneath the ground. And it comes squirting out through a different kind of limestone. And the limestone just precipitates out like the terraces in uh, Yellowstone. This is uh, the view from my homestead up in Alaska. You can't see the big mountains in the background there, but it's 300 miles to the Pacific Ocean, not a road, not a person, whatever, from, from my, the view from my window. So in the east, this is a pretty interesting map. Most of us have learned that this was historically primarily grassland. This was primarily wooded, closed canopy uh, forest. And what a lot of us don't know is this was like a sloshing back and forth between forms. These black dots, these black dots, and this black here is all the same plant community. Just displays differently. Over here, it would, they would appear in openings. And you can see how hurricanes would come and make openings. Uh, these would be big winds that get um, like uplifted over the tops of the Appalachians. Uh, this would be mostly driven by fire. Uh, and this would be dry uh, conditions and fire. Same plant community type. I'm going to list them in order of height from top down. The Fagaceae. Trees, oak, chestnut, and beech. What do they all have in common? What do they produce? Nuts. Big nuts, that's right. Uh, oak and beech um, produce irregularly, sporadically. It's called masting. I think in part because human beings haven't selected yet for the ones that, that produce every single year. Where are the people out there collecting acorns and planting them to find the ones that produce acorns year after year after year after year? Well, one of the companies is Mossy Oak. And they're participating with the Forest Keeling Nursery in Missouri have discovered this one particular oak that when it was only thigh high had its first acorns on it. It was a swamp white oak. And that parent plant has produced um, acorns every single year that are sweet enough so you can grab it with your hand and pop them in your mouth. Um, and turkey hunters were the ones that went out and GPS like hundreds of thousands of plants to find thigh high oak trees with acorns on it. Then it went through a screening process at Forest Keeling. You can, call it, you can buy it. It's called the Bucks Unlimited Oak. We need to do that with uh, beech. We need to develop more chestnuts that are more uh, tolerant of uh, chestnut blight and tolerant of the different soil types because the Northeast is extremely variable soil types. Apples were an understory um, in all this system. Instead of having like wild crab apples, what would you substitute for apples? How about apples, right? And hazelnut is a shrub. What kind of shrub would you sub substitute for hazelnut? How about hazelnut? And the Prunus's family, like plums, cherries, peach, almonds, apricots. How about, how about plums, cherries, peach, almonds, apricots? Maybe not almonds in Maine uh, yet, but I bet you somebody really gets on their game. 10 or 15 years, we got almonds in Maine. We just have to do the breeding work as part of our agriculture. Raspberries, grapes, currants, fungi, forage, and animals. Now, if you are a vegetarian and you eat no animal products, is there anything in there that you can eat? 
Is there enough in there to keep you alive? Is there enough nutrition in there to keep you healthy? Actually, in my book, Restoration Agriculture, there's a nutritional analysis of this diet right here. Two big shortages that are in there. Uh, one is selenium, um, which is needed only in small, small doses. You can get it from seaweed. And the other one is one of the most critical nutrients for human survival. And now it's considered exactly the opposite. What's one of the most critical nutrients that's in every cellular reaction in your body? Salt. Why do you think we crave salt? Because salt is very difficult to get in a terrestrial diet, in a natural terrestrial diet. You get plenty of fat. Come on, girl. <laughs> then if you want to eat the livestock, that's um, the most nutritious food in this whole entire mix right here happens to be liver. If you look at the top 10 uh, foods of any nutrient across the board, liver is always on that list somewhere. It's like the magic food. I think it's disgusting. <coughs> Um, that's all right. Uh, the walnut family, Juglandaceae, prunuses, raspberries, blackberries, elderberries, currants, gooseberries, grapes, fungi, forage, lives. Oh, by the way, where are the annual crops in here? Did you see any? I didn't see any. Once you plant the system, it's there for how long? Uh, I think a long time. Pecan, more warmer areas. I bet you it'll grow uh, up into the New England states. What you might not have, though, is um, you might not have enough heat units in the summer to, to really fill a kernel. But that only takes some breeding work. How many of you guys have this concept that it takes a long time to breed trees? You know what? That's a lie. That's a lie. You can get trees to reproduce, something happened to Mike, within a year. How do you do that? You plant 10 million seeds, and the ones that reproduce in a year, that's where you start. All of a sudden, you've got fast reproduction in the gene pool. Then you put those together, you have fast reproducing plants. The other ones just sell to people to make some cash. They're, they're still oak trees or chestnut trees. Well, now with these fast to reproduce ones, say I've got 10 that are reproducing within a year. The next year, this one makes two seeds. Who, who gets uh, put into the gene pool, represented in the gene pool more? The one with higher yields. And then so on and so on. And at the one that produces more, more seeds get in the, in the gene pool. The one that's resistant to the diseases, resistant to the pests, by, just by selecting for your fast to reproduce, pest and disease resistant, cold hardy, and able to survive with zero inputs, uh, you're, you're concentrating those genetics fast, fast. How many of you guys have uh, at least four apple varieties to your name that you've bred? Okay, you see one, we got one, all right, good deal. How many, how many people have ever heard this idea that, oh, you know, don't bother to save your apple seeds. They don't breed true to type. You know, and even if you did, it's going to take a thousand or so seeds before you even get one good variety. Who's ever heard stuff like that? Well, first of all, let's examine that. <sighs> Whose brilliant idea was it? Why did we buy into this lie that apple seeds don't breed true to type? I dare anybody to take apple seeds and put them in the ground and have any of them turn into a, a banana. They turn into apple trees but they, don't, they aren't genetically identical to their parent. That's the whole point of sexual reproduction. That's why it exists on this planet, is so you don't get two of me, right? <laughs> um, or two of you, for that matter. So we, we want that variability. Uh, so they don't breed true to type. Well, they do breed true to type, but they don't breed to be exactly like their parent. Well, then, then this nonsense is gonna take a 1,000 before you get one good variety. Who's tested that? The very first apple seed that I ever put in the ground and grew from a little cup as a kid when I found it in my lunch had perfectly, fantastically delicious, awesome fruit. The tree is like, you know, this big around. It's just amazing. Why aren't we doing this in every sixth grade class? You start planting your apple seeds in little cups and we save them and you take them home. You think little kids are gonna take care of their apple trees? No, so we're gonna, we're gonna raise trees that are, that are surviving abusive conditions because your little brother's pissed at you and he tries to mow over your tree with a lawnmower. You know, dad backs over it with the truck, you know, all these different other things that happen in the backyard. And eventually, a few of these trees are gonna survive, and then some of them are gonna taste really, really good, and some of them are gonna have high yields, and we're gonna select for the ones that don't get bothered by pests and diseases. If we started with every sixth grade doing that, in 10 years, how many new named varieties of pests and disease, zero input apples do you think we would have? Zillions, zillions, because we're not doing it, because we buy into this crap that says it doesn't breed true to type, and it's gonna come out, you know, a thousand, you get one. It's like, well, all right, let's change this thing around. Let's, maybe it is a fact that you need a thousand seeds in order to get one good variety. Let's change the concept. How many, 
apple seeds do you need to plant in order to get four good varieties? 4,000 seeds. So is there a, it's the same fact, same observable phenomena, the same reality. It takes 1,000 seeds to get one good variety, but a different behavior comes out of a different way of thinking about the fact. The fact may be it takes 1,000 seeds. Okay, how do we get four varieties? 4,000 seeds. Shagberry, hickory, persimmons, pawpaws, blackberry, raspberry, perennial, all of it. We can manage this using natural techniques. The most ubiquitous uh, around the world, actually, is the pines, and they're the pine nuts. Um, the, all of these co-host with pine nuts. This is the, like the natural Rosetta Stone of a perennial permanent agriculture that we grow everywhere. Did you know that you go out the, you look out the window here? Um, except for that. I'm willing to bet you a nickel that almost every single one of those plants is with an eyesight out the window here. And you don't even know it. We're surrounded by the most amazing abundance. Well, now we're talking about hunting and gathering. We can't go hunting and gathering. Okay, so I'm not talking about hunting and gathering. I'm talking about a new kind of agriculture. We're going to imitate these plant communities and we're going to pattern them just in, in such a such an, uh, certain way to manage the water. We can efficiently use equipment. We can harvest it at scale, et cetera. Um, and the, the pine that I use for pine nuts, it's a five needle in the white pine family. It's a Korean pine. And it it's actually the pine nut of world trade is the, is the Korean pine. So how do we get there if you've got like a cornfield or something? Well, we'll use the agroforestry techniques. We have to wrap ourselves in somebody's flag because we're weirdos. Every single one of you in this room is a weirdo. That's why you're here. Uh, but we're onto something. We are the passionate few that are making the change in this world because we actually dare to make the change in this world. And we're gonna make this change in the world because we got no choice. There's nobody else coming to help us out. We've gotta do this ourselves. So let's get a little bit of help and let's wrap ourselves in the agroforestry flag. We actually have a, a federal department that supposedly supports us. And the more of us crazies come at these people, they're now getting overwhelmed with us and they're starting to respond. It's like, oh, agroforestry has to be complex and ecosystem-based, <sighs> okay, because now they have a constituency. Um, one of the techniques, simple techniques, alley cropping, called silvo arable in uh, European lingo. You grow your regular crop, whether you're doing produce or field crops or pasture, you grow your regular crop in the alleys between rows of trees. Pretty simple. The agricultural crop gives us our uh, annual income, short term, while the longer term tree crop matures. Uh, these are a couple pictures now. That, this was not from my farm. This is, this, I want to show both succession and alley cropping. So this started uh, probably five years before this picture was taken. Um, and we've uh, alternated through uh, produce crops. We would go from a squash type, either, you know, uh, hard winter squash, zucchinis, or uh, cucumbers, then we would go to peppers afterwards, then we would go to three years of, of cover crops to rebuild the soil that we mined during those years. This is in a cover crop phase, which includes a grain crop that we could harvest for, for feed or for sale or to replant the system. Within the row of trees, we planted a polyculture. Some rows have rhubarb, some have garlic, some have chives. Uh, one point in time, I was one of the largest comfrey growers in the United States of America. Um, Comfrey is great, grows like crazy. Uh, don't till it because it grows even crazier. Um, and you can sell it up the wazoo and it's a pain in the butt. It's a real nuisance to get the leaf quality. Now look at the, also look at the trees. Why do they have leaves up high and not down low? I think. It says deer, so animals are browsing those trees, yeah. Look at it, look at all, the, it's getting hammered. So there's the chives that are in there right there. So we're getting multiple crops, we're getting we're getting the grain crops, we're getting produce crops, we're, and we're getting our herb crop. Uh, we're getting cut flowers, um, and, and the trees are getting hammered by the deer. I'm not going to spend money to take care of these trees. They're not producing me any money anyways. Why should I spend $10,000 a year to maintain an orchard? What is an orchard? Think about that. When I say orchard, do you get a picture in your mind? Is orchard something that nature created, or is this an idea that we came up with, that this is how our trees are supposed to be arranged, and this is how they are supposed to look, and when all of a sudden a deer comes in, oh, we have a problem. It's like, wait, you have a reality. Deer live here on planet Earth. They browse things. Do deer kill all the trees? If the deer killed all the trees, there'd be no trees. There's enough trees that were planted, so if you plant three trees, a deer could possibly kill your trees. You plant enough trees, 300, 3,000, whatever, acres and acres, um, and you, you kind of turn them loose, 
They can't keep up with it, and you will have deer browse. It's a fact, so what? Get over it, they're fertilizing your trees. Oh, another reason why they have browse is cattle. Look at the difference in the sizes of the trees. The system changes through time. We got succession going on. What do you think's happening to the soil? Because we have both the long-term perennial trees that are pumping sugars in, the leaf deposition, the bark deposition, the branches that are getting chipped, the roots that are growing and sloughing from the crop, all the straw, the nitrogen from all the clovers that are in there, the poop and the pee. We've got every single step of the process in there visible in these pictures, except for the fungal one, but we'll spend plenty of time on that later. Squash, uh, acorn squash and hazelnuts. 3,000, 4,000 plants per acre of acorn squash, 35, 40,000 pounds an acre. Uh, we live about, I live about four hours from the nearest like real city. So in order to get produce anywhere, you gotta get it on a truck and get it out of here. So many people ask, well, how do you find the markets for us? Like, time out. The markets exist for absolutely everything on this planet. You can even grind up old sneakers and turn them into pink plastic sandals and you can sell them. What do you do is you go to a place that actually sells the product that you want to produce and you ask them who's your distributor and you chase it back to the chain and then you find out who wants to buy from you. And you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out that you don't grow enough. The problem is not that you don't have markets. The problem is you don't have enough to supply the market. This is, this is a hungry planet. Well, I don't want to grow 7,000 acres. Well, neither do you and neither do you. So what we do is we all gain together and we now put all of our product together at one particular place. Now, all between of us, all of us, we can afford the processing equipment, we can afford the loading dock, we can get it on a truck, we can go to the distributor. You make a phone call, also Extension tells us, oh, before you grow anything, make sure you have your markets lined up. Do this experiment. <coughs> call a distributor, Southwater Market, or, or uh, Terminal Market in Boston, where the heck was that? Um, forgot what the, where it was, I've been there, New York. You call up, say, hey, hi there. My name's so-and-so, and I'm thinking about planting, eventually getting into planting. <laughs> They're buying stuff. They're buying truckloads of stuff. They're buying truckloads of stuff now, and say, you got broccoli? Cool, I need you know, 16 pounds of broccoli next Tuesday on a truck Tuesday. You do that? And you go, oh, let me talk to the other guys down the warehouse. You know, we're overcommitted and all that kind of whatever. So you find out how to supply them with what they want. And if you can't do it, you gang together with everybody else, and that's called a business. It's called a business. If we all together, we can be growing stuff this way and marketing it. Anybody ever heard of this um, a little co-op called Organic Valley? I was grower number 24 in Organic Valley. Produce grower for 20, this is my 24th season at Organic Valley. When I joined, there were 24 of us sitting around two picnic tables and we dreamed of the day that someday that we would have a million dollars in gross sales. Um, as of three years ago, it was the first year that we crossed over a billion. I'm an owner in the company that's my aggregator. Uh, I'm an owner in the company that owns the trucks that's the distributor. I'm an owner of the company that makes the fuel that I put in my tractor, and we grow it all. The difference between that and a good idea is the fact that we actually are producing something. So when we're talking about change, we have to actually do something, not just read about it, blog about it, and be a like monger. You're gonna get off your seat and get to work and do something for real at scale, and I'll go right back to permaculture. What permaculture really needs to do is come up with a real answer for real human need. Show me a project where you really are meeting human needs for real, no joke. Um, same with small scale, same with nutrient dense foods. This can't be a cult anymore, we have to do it at scale. Time's running out folks, any of you guys think we live in weird times? Okay, you're weird, that's why I figured it's weird times. We don't have any more time to screw around. We have to do this, we have to do this at scale, we have to do the ecological restoration that this planet needs everywhere. We can do it at a profit, but you can't do it by the way that we're told by the wizard of how to do it. You can't do it that way. It's a, it, we have to imitate nature, because nature bats last. Nature bats last. Chestnuts and sunflowers, chestnuts, uh, chestnuts. Sunflowers are great uh, weed control, they really get rid of all kinds of other weeds. So if I'm getting ready to do acorn squash, for example, and I got a little too many weeds in that patch last year, I'll put uh, sunflowers in. I'm part of an oil cartel. We, we bought a truck and a, and a press and a trailer, and uh, we also, as a group, um, contracted to have the guys come over from Germany, the techs, and we worked in one of our shops, and six of us converted our tractors in the Organic Valley internal shuttle fleet, all converted to run on straight vegetable oil. We produce our own fuel. 
Now, think about this. Oh, you go to the restaurant down the road and you get their fryer oil and then you get this $3,000 unit in the, in the back of your garage and you can make fuel. Five gallons? That's not fuel. It's like a cute little joke and you feel good about it. We said, all right, how many gallons of fuel do we need next year? Oh, these many gallons, all these different farms, boom. How many gallons of oil do you get per how many acres of sunflowers or camelina uh, or whatever the, the, the seed is of choice? We need these many acres. Okay, who's gonna plant it? We are. Where's the oil going? We're gonna sell the oil to a potato chip company? Can you sell a gallon of oil to a potato chip company? No, but if we have 100 growers growing oil for a potato chip company, we're not taking fuel out away from human food, we're using the oil to cook human food, and then when it's done, we buy it back, we filter it, we dewater it, then we put it into our tractors and we go farm. That's a fuel system, it's a closed loop fuel system. It, it's gotta be designed for real. And the only way to do that is have a certain scale. The only way to get to a certain scale is either do it yourself and get big, uh, or to do it with others. I hate working with others, oh my gosh, we fight, we argue, we have meetings, I've been to too many meetings, it's not fun. My dad, 87 years old, he was the health nut, okay? Hunting and fishing guy, he, was, he also, he personally knew Yule Gibbons, I didn't know, and he also knew the Rodales. Um, uh, friends with Charles Walters who founded Acres USA. Uh, 87 years old, he's not on a single um, chemical pharmaceutical. He's got his wits about him, he still talks to like things in other realms. <coughs> I'm fine with it as long as he's competent, you know, he's cool. Is uh, rye alley cropping between rows of apples so we get the yields, you get the yields, both crops. <laughs> Apples, hazelnuts, hybrid poplar, asparagus between chestnuts. Chestnuts, kale, collards. There's a person in there for scale, so you see that. This is a basically a one acre curved field that goes around that way, so this is alley cropping. And we turn that, turn that soil from red clay into topsoil, you know, in the 20 years of working it. Same, same field, a different year stage, same field again, the trees have obviously grown back to the grain part of the rotation. Um, this, <laughs> this is my youngest son um, when he was probably 14 years old or so. There's this idea called overyielding polycultures in, in uh, the agroforestry world. They use the term land equivalent ratio. Um, ecologists would use overyielding polycultures. What, what's been determined over time in ecological research is that the more species you have per unit area, the higher the total site yield. And at first I said, hmm, it must be functional relationships between them, so they do all kinds of tests through the years, and they're finding out, no, it doesn't really have anything to do with functional relationship between them. It has everything to do with sheer number total of species. So the more total species per acre you get, the more total yield you get. Well, that means that each individual yield is probably gonna be lower. And this was a prime example right here. Grow green bell peppers for wholesale, we fill, you know, put them on pallets and they go on a truck. Sunflowers are part of the oil racket, and then the next row over is um, uh, acorn squash. So on one acre of land, we planted one acre of chestnuts, one acre of acorn squash, one acre of green peppers, and one acre of sunflowers. And out of each one of those, we got a half a yield. So a half plus a half plus a half plus a half is two. We got two total yields off of one acre because we had four species in there. We got more total yield because we got less yield of each. Whew. Trip, okay, it works. We always strive to fatten up the ecological system. More flowers f uh, in the spaces here and there for, uh, for pollinator habitat, butterflies, et cetera. You know, bird houses for, for pest control. Uh, and we don't need to have like this dedicated habitat for butterfly habitat or pollinator habitat or you know, bird refuge. It's, it's integrated right into how we're growing stuff. Silvopasture is the uh, intentional combination of, and management simultaneously of both trees and livestock. Those are some happy uh, cattle out there and some happy trees as well. Um, Silver pasture is done most commonly in the uh, uh, south central part of the U.S. Uh, with pecan and uh, black walnut, the primary species from Illinois down to Texas, there's a lot of it done. And you have cattle out there and then at the designated amount of time when you gotta pull them off, you pull them off and then you have time goes by, you harvest it, you wash the nuts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I like to mob stock, and mob stocking means just have, it appears oftentimes that you have way too many animals per acre, but they're only there for a brief period of time, and they eat absolutely everything that's there, and there's nothing left, so they move. Um, so it's only episodically overstocked, but it keeps moving around. And you can get as few as five cattle anyways to mob. 
you keep them really closed tight in, in really hot wire, and they'll go shoulder to shoulder, then something snaps in their little brain and they're no longer five individual animals, they're now one animal, and you'll have one dominant. That's the only brain that I have to talk to right there. As long as I have a relation, that was Zorro, as long as I had a relationship with Zorro, everybody else would just follow Zorro right beside him. Look, the fence is way down here now. They, they're shoulder to shoulder. They just got in the habit of acting like a herd. You can protect your trees using fence. That's this, some guy, he's using um, barbed wire to protect his trees. So just planting your trees in your pasture is one way to do this. The grass underneath trees in a partial shade, a 30 to 60% canopy closure will actually be more nutritious especially for dairy animals, higher protein, more digestible, and it'll grow faster. In the heat of the day, it doesn't shut down because it's so hot, it keeps growing all throughout the day. So you get more grass yields of a more digestible grass. And the cattle are more comfortable because they'll eventually be shade all over the place instead of just that one tree that they gang up underneath and kill that tree. I stay away from tree tubes, um, mostly because I've pulled too many tree tubes out of the mouths of stupid Jersey steers. And it's just an ugly scene when you do it, and they don't like it, and I don't like it. And it teaches everybody else to go eat tree tubes, and so I stop using the tree tubes. Oh yeah, by the way, have I mentioned foresteag.com, edible woody tree and shrub crop nursery? You can get all these trees. Chestnuts are my favorite um, silver pasture tree, because I'm getting an incredible uh, crop off the uh, chestnuts, and it, it makes good grass uh, underneath it. It's an oak family. Another way to go do silver pasture is to move into exi existing wooded land. Now what I don't mean, and this is especially important in the Northeast, I don't mean go on to land that is a closed canopy forest that is a true forest that has a well-developed duff layer with uh, uh, um, shade tolerant ephemerals, spring ephemerals. That's a true forest that's been forest for thousands of years. It's just that maybe we cleared it and then it grew back to forest. There are areas that were open and have grown back from being in an open condition that don't have that well-developed duff layer, that don't have the lady slippers and that sort of, the cardinal flowers and that sort of thing. This is an area here that was an overgrown oak savanna. Would have been wide open oak trees with, with grasses grown underneath it. Um, this right here shows the boundary between two concepts. This person has an intellectual idea of agriculture and an intellectual idea of forestry. That's not how nature rolls. It doesn't use our ideas, it uses reality. And so what it does is it mixes trees with grass and grass with trees. How many people have heard over and over again, oh, you can't plant trees with grass around your trees, it'll kill your trees. How many have heard that? The grass is deadly for trees. Well, it is, for the wrong trees. And if you, if you let the grass get too aggressive on a particular site, maybe that's the wrong tree to go into that kind of grass. If, if grass killed trees, there wouldn't be any trees on this planet. There wouldn't be. The, this, this planet is, is co-evolved, co-existed, co-adapted, co-created, whatever you want, of grass and trees mixed together. So let's take the grass and move it in under the trees, and let's take the trees and move them out into the grass. Let's call Ernie, give him a bag of raisins and a five gallon bucket of diesel fuel and say, dude, go in there and make a mess. <laughs> Grinds up everything except for tires. Well, we ground up the tire at first, but when I saw these steel belts waving in the air, I thought of like Jersey steers eating tree tubes. It's like, I don't want them eating steel belts. Um, let's get the tires out of there, so we got rid of the tires. Harvest the trees that we wanted, retain the trees. With it, you know, we harvested this for lumber and for pulp, and we retain the trees that are deep-rooted. That's a hickory, oak. Uh, we le left a lot of walnut, um, something that produces nuts, um, especially for uh, pigs later on, and then we planted it with grass. This was left behind. This is before, this is after. This, uh, this is actually a value-added real estate shot because in this particular part of the world, forested land um, is considered um, you know, fairly junk land, so it's like $2,000 an acre. But if you get grass on it, all of a sudden it's like three dollars to $5,000 an acre. But then if it's recreational and it's really beautiful, then it's considered recreational land and it's even more than that. So what we're gonna be doing is, is interacting with our landscape and having the cash flow from our agriculture operation, the cattle, the livestock, the cattle, livestock, same thing the crops that we're growing, that's the cash flow that pays for us to do this management to make this property worth tons and tons and tons of money compared to what it was. And don't be afraid to put your animals right out there with the trees. They're happy, this is my place again. First crop you're gonna have when you do this is the first crop are uh, grazing folks. You hook into the grazing network. These people are obsessed. They'll drive 70 miles in freezing rain to get a can of soda pop and a bratwurst and walk around your farm going like, whoa, look at this, it's pretty cool. They pay 20 bucks to do it. It's the best money you'll make, it's awesome. <laughs> and, the, and the cows are happy. 
We retain a lot of the dead material for, for bird nesting habitat and so on. Then the piggies go out. They're my favorite, of course. Um, this is actually uh, an area, this particular spot is designed specifically for hog feed. And we've got, a, a, we'll, we'll raise a pig, it takes six months, not five, to get them up to 200, 250 pounds. Um, they'll be leaner than uh, a corn fattened pig, but the last month they finish on chestnuts. They, they're grass fed. They start with uh, um, currants and raspberries in the early part of the season. Then it transitions to mulberries. The mulberries are from like the middle of June all the way till the middle of August. When the mulberries are on the tree, the pig noses are purple and the pig rear ends are purple and you won't find them anywhere other than underneath the mulberry trees. Then they start eating um, apples. Then they start pulling grapes off the vine and to, to watch grapes prune, I mean to watch pigs prune your grapes and just crunch on these big bunches of green grapes is such a trip. Um, and then they uh, have hazelnut cleanings and then they finish on chestnuts when they get to the chestnuts, they basically double in weight. They just fatten right up on chestnuts. Feed cost, um, I actually do feed some concentrate, about a cup and a half a day per pig. When they're 30 pounds, it's most of their ration. And if they want to gain, if they want to get bigger, they got to go out and eat it. they got to go find it. And I'm not turning the pigs loose in the woods. That's a great way to destroy your woods. I designed a system to feed pigs that is now you know, partially wooded. Had sheep a couple of times, um, chickens, free range chickens. Uh, and I mean free range chickens, you turn them loose. You have enough feed to like call them and you scatter some feed when it's time to scoop them up. You get make a little hook out of a coat hanger and you catch them and you put them in a box and take them where you gotta take them. Uh, turkeys, great insect control. Also the chickens are great insect control. They, they scratch apart the cow patties and the sheep patties and eat fly larvae. I treat the sheep kind of like the US Marines. You t if, when things are a real mess, man, you turn in the sheep you throw them in this really bad situation, they make things worse, they make a mess of things, and then you just shoot them. Um, and so, uh, Jurassic chickens. Uh, this was a period of years we did, I think it was like six or eight years that we, we decided to keep, retain hens through the winter time and save the eggs, incubate them, and you get these little chicks, you throw them underneath the hens and you see how many survive. And at first we had about 90% predation mortality in the early years, but by year four, the old gals had figured it out. They got enough cover hiding out underneath the trees um, that, that by year five and six, there, there wasn't any mortality to predators because the chickens were too smart. And the new baby chicks, you throw them in underneath the old girls um, the next spring, and they, they're cold, so they go hang out underneath the mother. The first year, the mothers were never mothers before. They couldn't figure it out. But by the second year, I mean, it was like, you just throw these chickens under. So what were the brooding costs? What with the feed costs? They're out there eating bugs and having a great time fertilizing things. So you walk somewhere, you never know where you'd see chickens. And all of a sudden the grass goes and you're surrounded by a swarm of these Jurassic chickens. These are not tame little barnyard chickens. They, they are not tame. And the turkeys and the sheep and the cows. This area has had zero uh, machine maintenance, no mowing whatsoever. It's only animal maintenance in there. The mulberries are for the pigs for when the pigs go through. So that after the cattle go through is like when I like to move the pig through. Um, do you actually harvest the chickens? Or do you just oh yeah, oh yeah, harvest the chickens, you bet. You know, we're allowed, we were allowed to have a thousand um, slaughtered on farm. And so instead of doing that, that was kind of cool at first. It's like, let's just sell the chickens. Just sell the chickens to people who, you know, there's people in town near us. And so the things with, think, here we go, marketing talk, quick. You're gonna have an X. One is price per unit and the other one is volume. The higher the price, the lower the volume you're gonna be able to sell, period. The lower the price, the higher the volume you can sell. So on that X, we've got things located here and there. So on the produce side of things and on the beef, we can sell all the produce that we grow. The, the wholesale produce market will take everything that you can grow. That means you gotta get up to scale to do it. So either you do it on your own or you join a aggregation group, call Organic Valley. If you want to grow vegetables and get on the truck, just give them a call. Um, we've got growers all over the country. So we have the produce and then the cattle. Here's a, um, I'll talk a little bit about it tomorrow. The sale barn sucks, it's miserable. These are, these are GMO fed, corn fed, confined animals, these sickling little, you know, yearling calves. A lot of them are dairy steers, not even good genetics. We go in there, last spring, these are, this was uh, done in Ithaca, New York. I did the numbers live. Last May, you could have bought a 500 pound um, dairy steer for a dollar a pound. 
take this dollar a pound, so it costs you 500 bucks. You bring it home, you put it on the green grass. It eats green grass over the summer. It gains about 300 pounds in six months. Then you take it back to the sale barn and you sell it. It weighs 800 pounds. Guess what the average sale price was? About a buck a pound. Well, when you're buying the animals in the spring, that's when everybody wants to buy them because all the seasonal grazers need it for the grass. So you're buying when the price is high. Well, then when you're selling, you're selling when the price is low because everybody's dumping their livestock. So that's the opposite of what you're supposed to do. But we're buying high and selling low. And then when you sell an 800 pound animal in the fall for $800, your investment was 500, you turn it into 800. That's a 60% return on your investment, but it only was six months. So it's 120% return on your, on your investment. Does anybody have a problem with making 120% return on investment? So why the hell do we need a closed herd, the perfect genetics, the this, that, and the other thing? Buy cheap genetics, raise it for six months, give it a good life, call it by name, give them hugs, put one in the freezer. Now we take 10% of our profits and put it in the freezer. Oh no, we're only making 110% return on our investment. It's so simple. And if you don't have a trailer, cool. Go down to the sale barn and see all these big guys with a third grade education, their bellies out here in coffee cups. Say, yo, John, can you do a favor? Pick me up three of those 500 pounders and bring them up to their farm. How much you charge me to deliver? Oh, 50 bucks. Okay, cool. So that works into it. Now I've got $100 worth of expense because he delivered them in the spring, took them away in the fall. And they're like kids. You just like lead them along with a bucket. Um, how do you like that for really fast agricultural math? Turkeys. I keep the animals right out there with the trees. I got damage on the trees. If they kill the trees, it's because you didn't move them fast enough. You didn't move them fast enough. And the trees get a nice mulch layer. The packed down grass gets eaten, gets turned into 72 cow patties a day and 35 gallons worth of urine per animal. That's pretty cool. That's really, really cool. That's a lot of fertilizer. And then the pigs in the fall, um, out underneath the chestnut trees, uh, fattening up. Pardon? I put rings in their noses, yep, because, um, because I, I, want, I don't want them to really muck it up. That what they'll do when the chestnuts are really uh, yielding, we had a super, super wet year this year, like four times the annual uh, rainfall, um, and they, they would use their bottom jaw to rip up the sods. And when, a, when a chestnut would fall in like a little nook between grass, they just go right in after it. And they did a pretty, they made a, a pretty big mess, but the grass is still intact and it'll, it'll bounce back. And what's really fascinating too, this is precision fertilizing. You know, you get your, your four-wheeler or your big, huge truck with the GPS and all this kind of stuff, and you put your soil test into it, and it says which area needs more fertilizer, and you're going along, and the computer decides what to put where. Well, the plants that produce the most crop obviously need more fertilizer. So how do I make sure that these trees, the heaviest producing trees, get more fertilizer? The pigs go get them. There's more chestnuts there. They'll hang out there longer. They eat more chestnuts, they poop more. It gets more fertilizer because it yields higher. It, it yields higher, it needs more fertilizer. Wow, who designed this? Pardon? The kind of chestnuts I use, I, um, uh, where, where I grow in Wisconsin, it's too cold for Chinese chestnuts. And of course, American chestnuts get blight. So I grew both Chinese chestnuts and American chestnuts and I brought, bought hybrids from everywhere that I could. First stage, you go get genetics from everywhere you can. You bring them together and then you treat them with sheer total utter neglect and you see which ones survive. And they cross pollinate with one another, open pollinated, and you s s uh, plant the ones that reproduce the fastest, the most yield, pest and disease resistant. Um, and so then you just keep that going, going with that process. And, and what's happening, I originally thought that the cold hardiness would come from American chestnut and the blight tolerance would come from Chinese. But what I'm realizing also is that that selection process would also select for cold hardy Chinese genetics. Because more and more of my hybrids, I can only call them hybrids because they got a mix of genetics in there. My, my most recent hybrids look very Chineseoid. And so that's hazelnut waste. This was really fascinating. This um, plot was part of what was um, uh, listed in, in my book. Uh, this is where University of Illinois, this actually, this 10 by 10 meter plot was the 10 by 10 meter plot that started the Savannah Institute. If you guys look into the Savannah Institute, PhD guys, um, you know, young kids in their 30s doing research on perennial polycultures. Uh, this plot right here produced um, uh, more human food per, you know, <coughs> unit area than a comparable piece of corn ground would. And um, it start, had everything from the currants to gooseberries, raspberries, grapes, 
mulberries. The meat, of course, was there. And what I really like about this is 15 years prior to this picture being taken, it was a cornfield. So in 15 years, this, this generated a net revenue every year. Did it make two and a half million dollars a year? Did I pay all my bills with the revenue that comes off of this type of agriculture? No, so what? What, 85, 90% of all farmers are receiving the majority of their income from something other than farming? How many of you guys get 100% of your income from farming? I didn't think so. So don't worry about it. All right, so why don't we come up with a type of agriculture that doesn't cost us a zillion dollars and doesn't break our backs with endless labor. Let's imitate nature, make a couple of bucks. This is all net profit and it's pretty easy peasy. When I'm not truly really trying to push things, I'm just trying to let it guide the successional process through time and harvest the yields and pay for itself. Um, this is a little video we don't have time for, so I'm gonna flip over it, but this is a, a system. I'll let it go for a little bit because I want you to see the difference. This is one season, uh, and what's to the right is you'll see what the guy's doing now. He's moving into this, this piece of uh, formerly open uh, savanna ground. It was a cornfield that grew up to trees, and he's moving back in and opening it back up to grass. He put no grass in the understory. So if you look at, off to the right, and as soon as it gets to the right, so you can see the difference, I'll stop it. Here's an area of uh, silver pasture conversion by removal of material. Instead of adding trees to pasture, we're uh, removing brush so the grass can rebound Go. beneath the uh, oh. tree cover. And what we see in front of me, uh, all the grass here was natural regeneration. There was no grass seed. Uh, applied to here. This is all in the You may have to add seed at your place. All the landowner did was remove brushing material, let some sun in, get some grazing animals on there. As I move to the right, look at notice, that. Also, look how thick the uh, underbrush becomes. Boom. Oh, you bum. That's what I wanted to show you is that line between enough sun and not enough sun. Our indicator of how to manage these systems is going to be the vegetation response. And that was just one season difference of removing those trees. Now, how do we remove those trees? Do we go in there, we treat it as work, and we work our asses off, and it's a project and an expense? Or are we going to go in at the right time and figure out how to extract every last dollar out of that when we go in there? Everything from saw logs to firewood to mushroom logs to mushroom stumps to chips that we're then going to inoculate with mushrooms. And that's, this is a, a part of this uh, property that's had 10 years of that treatment. So we can take a project that looked like just overgrown jungle brush and in 10 years turn it into this. At a profit. At a million dollars an acre profit? Of course not. Of course not. But we're not going to break the bank and it's not that much work. Here. Now, back to overyielding polycultures. I'm going to blast through this. This is approximately our latitude right in here. Uh, right in between the 30 and the 50. That the, these curves show how much sunlight is available to grow a crop. And if we're farmers, we are in the photosynthesis business. Our job is to maximize photosynthesis on our site because the most photosynthesis we have gives us the most opportunity for some sort of product we can sell. If you're gonna grow corn, the old adage, knee high by the 4th of July, the longest day of the year is June 21st. We missed it. We want to have a fully deployed canopy of green catching sunlight when there's 20 hours of sunlight available to us. These little puppies are only this tall by 4th of July. That's so stupid. One of the things about corn, it's about 90 plus percent efficient. Whatever the sunlight hits it during that two, three week period, it turns into carbohydrate that we can turn into food. So you got about two weeks worth of actual efficient capture of sunlight. And then the rest of the year, any time the temperature is above 32 degrees, has anybody actually been outside today? Is it above freezing today? All those trees are photosynthesizing. You scratch the bark off the young branches, what color is it? It's green. What does green do in a plant? It's photosynthesizing. Did you know that chloroplasts last, persist for three years in wood? They only uh, cease to persist when it becomes too dark. So as you get three years worth of growth, you got almost an inch of wood. There's enough light coming through an inch of wood to keep a couple of chloroplasts alive. These trees are photosynthesizing right now, taking carbon out of the atmosphere. What are they doing with it? Most, uh, most root growth and development and most of the liquid carbon pathways coming from the trees are being pumped into the soil right now in the wintertime. That's part of our soil building process. That's all nutrient we can use next year. So there's our example, corn. This is our approximate area, uh, four months 
times 14 hours a day is 28 month hours of photosynthate. That's how much we're getting out of the corn, if we're getting 100% of it. Now, trees are not as efficient. They're not going to take up as much of that sunlight as, as corn, C4 corn. But it's a lot more effective because it's over a longer period of time. In some cases, it goes 12 months out of the year down in the, in the you know, middle states and further south. How much photosynthate do we got? <coughs> Nine months at eight hours, 36 month hours of photosynthate. We already have more potential yield coming out of these trees. Uh, our trick is to figure out how to put it into a marketable form, how to get it into a food form. Well, we have other things that help. You ever looked at the woods out here? I told you to look at it already. There's going to be things that come up in the spring before the trees are even leafed out that are our spring ephemerals. They come and go before the corn's even in the ground. You ever, ever heard of ramps? Sure. How about, well, this, it's a decomposer side of it, morels and so on. There's all these spring ephemerals. Spring beauty is a beautiful little spring green. Uh, uh, Watercress, wintercress, uplandcress, peppercress, all these amazing spring ephemerals that are another yield for us if we set up the system and include it. And then we've got the summer ephemerals. A lot of medicinal herbs fall in this category. These are all shade tolerant, living under the canopy now. Um, oh, and now let's grow some corn in the alley between rows of trees. But since we've taken up some of that room with trees, we don't have as much room for as much corn. And because we're going to have some shading effect going on, we're going to get lower yields on our corn. Oh, no, only 20 hours of photosynthate in our corn. Quick, you know, annual crops increase a 30% reduction in yield. You can't feed the world this way. You know, get the security, get these people out of here. But the total yield that we're talking about is over double the potential yields of an annual crop system. The energy that we're playing with is what we're talking about. We want to capture as much of that sunlight energy as we possibly can, and we've got to do it with green. We've got to do it with green. That doesn't even count the animals or fungi. So how we do it is with a canopy architecture. I'm going to flash through this. And as a tree grows, it grows to a phase. It's increasing its green, increasing its green. And all of a sudden, when it reaches maturity, it's going to slow down. And it's no longer going to be in rapid growth. So when it becomes an adult, so to speak, it plateaus. So there's this, it gets established for a little bit, and then it skyrockets, and then it plateaus as an adult. We want to keep it in that rapid growth phase where it's really cranking. It's like if you've got a motorcycle that's going 7,000 RPM, 75,000 RPMs, you want to keep it pegged as long as you can without blowing the machine up instead of like idling down at a cool 2,500 and going along. So this, I'll come back to this tree later. That's important. So the leaf area just before the canopy closes is when we have an upper limit of how much sunlight we can catch. And you sh I showed you the picture where there was grass and then all of a sudden no grass. That's what we want to pay attention to. Once that grass under our trees starts to thin out and disappear, we need to open it up and get more sunlight in there. That's our indicator. You think about our lungs. The more surface area we have exposed to the air, the more oxygen we get into our system. The more surface area we have exposed through high, tall canopy trees, you know, understory trees, mid-story trees, shrubs, bushes, ground laying, uh, growing herb herbs, vines that are growing on the system. The more green we have exposed, the more sunlight we can capture and the more air we can take out of the air. Here's, here's the thing about shade. Think about this for a second. If you go and you put up an umbrella and you're in the shade, you have a light meter, it says you got like 50 units of light. I don't know whatever they use. Now, now what is it? Thank you. Foot candles. She's a foot candler. <laughs> it's like an ear candle, but use it on your foot. Okay. So you get these many, whatever, <coughs> light units, foot candles, a light unit, underneath an umbrella. Well, then you go over here to a, uh, into a forest with the same measurement, the same amount of light. And then let me ask you a question. Which shade will be cooler? If it's the equal amount of shade, it should be equal, right? Evapotranspiration. It's not just evapotranspiration. Think about it. The sunlight is coming out of the atmosphere, and we're just sucking it up. And we're turning it into a living being. We're taking those photons right out of the atmosphere. Poof, gone. Uh, that's pretty cool, whereas an umbrella just bounces it away. And yeah, there's also evapotranspiration, but that's a secondary effect. Um, these right here all have more photosynthesis going on than what a lot of people would think of. This is a nice, healthy, efficient, growing forest. You plant the trees, you turn it loose, you give them 35, 40 years, you got nice straight saw logs for two by fours. Yippee, I made 7% return on my investment, good. Where's the green? It is not growing as fast as it can. 
your trees will grow so much faster, your carrots will grow so much faster. If you thin them out and get more sun in there, I would want to thin this out and get grass down there. Well, then all the brush is going to grow up and you'll take nutrients and moisture from the trees. That's right. And I'm going to go take the grass, I'm going to turn it into cows, and then I'm going to turn it into pigs, and I'm going to turn that into a cash flow during the year. So I'll grow more pine than you faster on the same amount of ground, and I'll actually pay my way. And you'll just sit there and have nothing but taxes to pay year after year after year. I do have a lot of pine on my land. What kind do you think I have? It's a five needle white pine type. Korean pines, yep. So this right here, this is a highly, to me, this is a highly functional um, sunlight capturing device. Uh, deep canopy structure, I've got grass down, you know, grass is, is thick and lush, uh, and I've got trees that are 30, 40 foot tall now after 25 years. I can get 300 pounds of beef off of that, and I can get 500 pounds of pork off of that at minimum. Not to mention the chestnuts, the hazelnuts, the apples, the, the um, cut flowers, the herbs, the currants, the berries, the grapes, the fungi, um, the deer. I <laughs> my laptop was in the shop and I needed my laptop. I'm stressing, I got this presentation I gotta get put together, right? And so as I'm waiting for my charger to come back from the shop, um, it's Friday, it's deer season, I got a license, I haven't shot deer in years, I'll go, sure, I'll sit under a tree. And so who walks by me but a, a deer? So I shoot a deer, clean it all up. I spend Friday dealing with deer. Well, then some friends came over, and it's like, well, it's okay. I'll go out, we'll set you up. And so then I go out Saturday and got another one. And then Sunday afternoon, it's like the last walk of the day on Sunday afternoon. Hopefully my computer will be fixed. I'm going to get another one. So I spent three freaking days processing deer. We're creating the most amazing wildlife habitat, which is an additional yield. Guess how much? There were four people that came hunted on my par property. How much do they pay per day just to walk around and not shoot a thing? 500 bucks each. That's not bad. So three days times two grand a day, six grand to lay out under a tree. My only problem was I had to shoot deer and I gave it to them because I didn't need it. So succession and uh, alley cropping that eventually turns to silver pass. You just watch the picture change. One of the things that you want to do when you plant trees in a uh, alley cropping situation or in your pasture situation is starting when you first plant those trees, use a subsoiler, a hook, a deep ripper, and cut the uh, soil on either side at least once every couple of years to keep the roots from going out and taking nutrient and moisture from your crop because you need yield from your crop in order to cash flow. Um, some people don't do it, but you will have a decline in yields right next to the row of trees. Don't go cut the roots on the edge of the woods right next to your fields because you'll cut big roots and you'll get rot and it'll kill all the trees and the world will come to an end. <laughs> as deep as I, I subsoil as deep as I can. As deep as the subsoiler goes. So, you know, in a hard thick, I could only get it eight inches deep in the early years when it was hard red clay, but now I can bury it like, it's like a finger through toilet paper. It's pretty. Pardon? I also do it in the alleys, you know, parallel with roads, yeah for water, I do it for compaction removal and water penetration, air penetration. So this is a few years later, you can see, you know, we got squash going here, cover crops, this is yellow sweet clover, fall that followed a, a patch of rye, asparagus, I got two acres of asparagus, best, best perennial crop I ever planted. You know, if I could harvest, one human being who's motivated can do lunges every day. This is a martial art, we're training, we're not working. You do it with picture perfect poise and it's exercise, you do about 5,000 um, lunges every morning for six weeks in a row, and then I cut and pack, um, you know, a ton or so of asparagus a year. That's another couple years down the road, you can see the asparagus. A few more years later, you know, this is in the grain rotation. Notice the tree, everything's changing. The conditions are always changing. If ever I get too much shade, um, I'll go cut trees down. It's not a problem. A few more years later, say, yeah, the heck with the annual crops, no more grains in there. We'll plant it to the weeds that I saw. The weeds that I saw were mulberries and elderberries and raspberries. Cool, why don't I plant elderberries and mulberries and raspberries? And then it starts to close the canopy too much. I start to get some regeneration of sugar maple. It starts to get too shady. The grass doesn't grow well. Time to open up the canopy because I'm not capturing as much sunlight as I could. As Soon as you start to see that grass die back, time to open that canopy up. That's not the end of the world. I built a, I built a barn. You know, it's a 70 by 80 
metal pole building, all the wood, all the lumber came from trees I planted. Uh, then I have firewood and then mushroom logs, leave the brush right on the ground. What do I do with mushroom logs? I inoculate it with mushrooms. Um, my favorite to do, it's not necessarily, I don't, I eat a lot of it, but I don't sell very much of it. I sell a fair amount of the shiitakes. Um, is wine caps with the sawdust spawn. After, you go at right here. After this, I'll walk through it and I'll throw that sawdust spawn all over the place. And then I'll go through with my mower and chip all the branches up. It's a flail chopper, it's an orchard mower. That's the one really expensive kind of piece of equipment on the farm that I use. It's worth every penny of it. I can grind up a two inch thick um, stick, you know, turn it into like splinters um, in no time. Um, so here's my ramule wood chips. This is my mulch. How do you get like five tons of wood chip mulch spread on your property? You ever done that per acre? Well, why not grow it? Then you cut it at a profit from firewood sales, lumber sales, from eventually mushroom sales. I eat a lot of mushrooms, a lot of mushrooms. And this is just a picture of me when I've done it in the summertime. You know, you just kind of thin them out here. You drop the branches. You pick up the, the mushroom logs, dry through, grind it all up. Here's nice leaf mulch. So that's adding to the decomposition part of the cycle. Um, that's a lot of like ramial wood chips, small diameter of wood. It's fuel, that decomposition rate, if you stand out there too long, it's gonna decompose you and take you down. Yes, sir. Do you market this area? Pardon? Do you market this area? I haven't marketed this for feria. The, uh, um, I've done oyster, you know, morels, wild found morels, um, oyster, um, uh, Inokis and shiitakes. I'm part of the Organic Valley Co-op and they know that I'm sporadic. And so they, you know, I, I just give a call and they say, oh, bring them on down, these many pounds. So it's all sold. And that's what it looks like after I'm finished. And we're told that shiitake doesn't naturalize. That's not true. They release spores and when you start managing your system they have all this material around. I've got shiitakes wild. I had shiitakes growing out of my chicken coop loof once right out of the plywood. I don't know what they were getting out of that. But this is out of the wood chips on the ground. <coughs> Oysters in the stump. Um, all of it, is it possible that these mushrooms, edible mushrooms, can be planted on wood from trees, purchased from foresag.com at the table with the calendar up? I mean, the, yeah, the catalog out there. Um, where wood, biomass, decomposes. It's going to. Well, why not put the fungus in that we want? With the stropharia, though, um, I'm, I'm at the point where I've got naturally reproducing stropharia. It's just, it's all over the place. And I like that. And that's, a f give it a few weeks later, because I didn't let the grass die, it rebounds real quick. There's more stropharia popping up. And so what I'm not doing is I'm not focusing on any one enterprise as my enterprise. I'm a vegetable farmer, you know, I'm a cattle farmer, or I'm a mushroom farmer. I'm an ecosystem manager and I'm harvesting every part of this ecosystem and the way that I'm able to get it to market is because I work with others and the, the bulk products like cattle go to the sale barn and a couple go to friends at $3 a pound instead of a dollar a pound. Now I'm making $2,400 for an 800 pound animal. There's thousands of percent return on my investment. And then the produce goes bulk wholesale. Those are the two big, the big ones that you can't grow enough to get rid of them. Pigs are happy. Um, if you go and disturb this ecosystem in such a way that you stop this, this, there's a lot of focus being put on carbon sequestration. We've got to get the carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. So like, well, that's not how the planet really works. How the planet really works is carbon is a fuel and you keep running it through the system. It's, it's a live, living, fluid thing that's got to move through the system. You've got to keep it moving. Yeah, some's going to accumulate and turn to coal eventually. But what we want to do is we want to get this engine ramped up and going as fast as it possibly can. And we do that by maximizing the canopy architecture. And once that thing is humming and it's in that phase of sunlight from 150 feet right down to the ground, full decomposition rate going on, fully stocked with animals, that thing is just in overdrive. And that carbon is just cycling through the system um, fast as can be. What about this right here? What's feeding that system? There, there's nothing refeeding the carbon into that system. How many fo calories of fossil fuel for a calorie of corn? About 10 from eco-literacy, they say. To get a, a pound of beef, you need 10, 10 times that to make one pound of beef. Eight times that to get a, a, a pound of milk. How many of you guys sit down and enjoy a dinner of grass? 
How many of you guys have sat down and enjoyed a dinner of sticks? I do, almost all the time. It's called beef and mushrooms. You know, the, 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 they can take sticks and turn it into milk, fat, and so on. So how many, um, where's the nutrition if plant fertility is coming from NPK and you have no decomposition cycle, no full complete ecological life cycle, where's your nutrition coming from if all you're eating is processed glyphosate contaminated GMO non nutritive indigestible carbohydrate filler with BHA and BHT to preserve freshness? And, and if you're eating the annual grains and legumes, tell me, where is your crop and where is your gizzard? And you wonder why we get diabetes and, and heart attacks. Come on. We're not, look at our teeth. You can look at any animal. They eat. Their diet can be determined by their dentition and the digestion. We're monogastrics with omnivore teeth. 50% of our teeth are molars, which are designed to crush coarse plant parts. We should have 50% of our diet should be plants. We only have 12% incisors for snapping fruit and stuff like that. We got four canines for taking a little meat off the bone. So maybe we should have the bulk of our diet as plants, a whole bunch of fruit and, and coarse vegetables, and a little bit of meat to throw in on top of that. Try it sometimes. Carbon is the energy running the whole system. And as a side effect of farming this way, this is a certified organic farm down the road. Good, certified organic, love it. This is healthier. It's better than the GMO, non-nutritive stuff. We've got loggerhead trikes. I got snapping turtles living on the farm. We have the spider webs. You saw the tree frogs. Where is there more life? Where is there, what system supports more life? This or this? Which one actually is more net profitable per acre? This or this? Which one has more total net return is probably this that also has more net expenses. This one has lower return, lower yields, but a higher margin. More of it goes in my pocket and in my belly and around my rib cage. I eat some of the best food in the world. How many trees, trees and vernal All, there's over 40 different vernal pools on my, on my property here. I love this right here. I got a tree frog trying to eat a Luna Moth caterpillar that's three times its size. These Luna Moth caterpillars are the size of a hot dog when they're fully extended, and they turn into a moth the size of a dinner plate. I got three different species of weasels on the farm. What are they doing for me? Rodent control. I've got endangered species on the farm. It used 20, 23 years ago, 24 years ago, it was a cornfield, a cornfield. I've got endangered species on the farm. Who are we gonna protect them? Well, you know how I got them there? By farming. I farmed my way into endangered species habitat. Northern cricket frog, and I forgot what this is called. This is translucent, you can almost see right through it. It's an amazing, trippy little fungus. One of the rarest fungi in North America. With the simplest of tools, animal impact, fire, rest, technology, and an understanding how nature actually works instead of our silly concepts, we can participate in the optimization of life at any scale on an any site on the planet. Do you think we've got food growing in here somewhere? Grapes trellised on the apple trees. Hazelnuts growing underneath. Chestnuts growing up above. Do you think I eat well? Yeah, I think I'm, that's all right. Oh yeah, sure, I'm okay. I'll be all right. Inputs create your next set of problems. Why would I spray fungicide in my apples to get rid of apple scab? Why would I spray a fungicide in my apples when it gets rid of fungus? $50 a pound. And look at all the plants that are growing around there. Why would I do tillage or mulch underneath my trees to get rid of grass when I could grow daffodils and irises and I sell cut flowers at 10 cents a stem and I sell the iris roots for uh, skin care cream and the flowers also for, for cut flowers, 10 cents a stem. Daffodils bloom about three weeks before an apple does. That's exactly the same amount of time that it takes bees, apis species, to generate the next generation. Brilliant. They're out there reproducing on the pollen I produce for them and they tell the kids to go right back where you came from here, and that's where it is next week. Comfrey, beautiful overwintering habitat for beneficial insects. Um, oh, you won't get yields with that way. No, we won't get those yields. Like, sorry. A system like this will experience increasing yields and fertility with decreasing costs for how many millennia? It's gonna produce food forever. I, I I've taken vacations before, like the whole year off, never did a thing. I come back and the farm's better. Because that's, that's the way nature works. You get it yet? I mean, seriously. I want to end on this picture for a reason. I, I mentioned the thing with, um, with uh, I, got, I got minutes. I got 12 minutes. I mentioned um, 
sustainable agriculture. But if you have to plant your crops again next year, that's not very sustainable. I said that you'll, you'll get, this farm is gonna be productive forever. Well, how long is forever? This tree right here is the largest diameter tree trunk of any tree on the face of the planet ever measured, period. It was 179 feet across the base of this thing. It's on the top 100 oldest organisms on the face of the planet. Not top 100 oldest trees, it's on the top 100 oldest organisms on the face of the planet. This is a chestnut tree, El Castaño de Cento Cavalli, that's growing two thirds of the way up the side of Mount Etna in Sicily. It experiences approximately three to five earthquakes a day. It's been burned by pyroclastic explosions like multiple times through its whole entire life. And it's been producing chestnuts regularly uh, for approximately 3,990 years. It's a 4,000 year tree, 4,000 years. Who has ever taken care of it? Nobody. What's it growing in? The solid frickin' rock. You ever seen trees growing in cliffs? Yeah, they grow in cliffs. Who prepared the soil? Who did the composting, the mulch, the spray? Nobody did anything. They grow in the rocks. This thing has been growing in the rocks for 4,000 years. That's pretty sustainable. They built a culture around it. And it wasn't until the Romans came in and kicked their ass and took away all their property and turned them into shyster little hoods that they had to turn into mafia, and it's a different story. Um, they were, they were tree-based people, and this was one of their big, big deal trees. Regeneration has a lot of talk these days. Well, problem with regenerative, as it's being using right now, the marketing people and the, and the, and the um, uh, certification people forgot to consult the ecologists. And forestry, natural resources, and ecology has a definition for regeneration that goes back 400 years with PhD research. Regeneration is the ability of a system or a species to reproduce itself, propagate, and expand using only the site as it is and the natural disturbance regime that occurs there. That is the actual factual 400-year-old definition of regeneration. And until the regenerative agriculture movement adopts that as their definition of regenerative agriculture, I will not stand by the marketing people that want to have another way to sell a product that isn't based on regeneration. This is regenerative agriculture. Why? This is the Piedmont of Italy. There's uh, abandoned villages here, here, and over here. That, that these villages are like 2,000 plus years old as far as we know. They lived in houses made out of stone. They had a complete culture going on. It was all feudal system and all that. They grew all their garden stuff. Wheat uh, and grapes were like, so wine and bread and cheese and dairy. Well, then the trees, you know what the trees are? Most of these trees are chestnut and walnut with an understory of hazelnut, apple, and pear. The evergreens that you see are Italian pine, which happens to be a pine nut pine. During World War II, Mussolini formed this alliance with Hitler, and they need these tunnels that go through the mountains. And these guys said, we don't like you guys. They kept blowing up the tunnels. So this alliance never got going between Germany and, and Italy. So Mussolini went up there, cleaned everybody out, put them down, work in the factories and in the farms, cleaned it out. These villages have been abandoned since World War II. You go up there right now, the kids are trying to move back, but the property descent is just legally crazy. It take, takes more to sort out the title deed than it does to actually go fix the place up. So what's there? Um, how about chestnut and hazelnut and, and plums and grapes and olives and figs and Korean, uh, not Korean pine, Italian pine. This, it's a complete ecosystem and it's in place. That's regenerative because it regenerated itself and expanded and grows. Strawberries and the cracks of the rocks, dandelions, fireweed, knit bone, medicinal herbs, pennyroyal. Um, oh yeah, did I mention it's growing out of the solid rock? There's no soil. We can grow food everywhere. Why aren't we? That's what this will become. I can go away for 65 years and come back. I can rip Van Winkle this deal. It'll come back, it'll be better. Does any of this make any sense? Make any sense? Ecological refugia, very important. 1980, I was a junior in high school. This mountain near my cousin's house, full of life and green, a wilderness area, a national park, beautiful, rich, abundant, healthy place. <laughs> Kaboom! It was an ecological disaster. I got two minutes, right? Oh, I thought I was supposed to end at the 2.30. All right. A ecological refugia. We need to set up ecological refugia so the natural process take place. At least it's you. Yeah. You're pretty unforgiving. I can handle that. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.